So I want to welcome everybody to the June edition of Everyone Has a Voice. Thank you for coming on this wonderful um, day. I want to thank uh, Director Paul Engel and the Brockton Library for giving us this wonderful space to um, read our poetry, say our truth. We have our features in the house. But first, um, we have a special treat. Um, my co-host for today is Deidre Smith, who is an English teacher at Brockton High. Um, we are very fortunate to have her today, and she's going to be conducting the open mic. And I know we have some of, some of our youth who are going to be um, reading their poetry, so we're very excited. So, Miss Deidre Smith. Thank you so much. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. It's an honor to be here this afternoon. Um, becoming co-host was um, a surprise, <laughs> but I'm, I'm happy to be here. I love poetry. Um, I love the city of Brockton. Uh, I work at the high school. I've worked at the high school almost 20 years, and it's just a joy to be here. Uh, Jessica is a former student of mine. Um, I had Jessica in English class when she was a freshman at the high school. And um, we did a lot of work with poetry that particular year. And what I loved about Jessica was her ability to take um, her amazing artwork and also combine that with her writing. And uh, she's a lovely young woman. And I just have a couple of things that I'm going to read. This is. Um, the little blurb that Jessica wrote about herself in the program uh, for today's um, event. Uh, my name is Jessica and I come from a full life of color and wisdom that this virtuous place called the universe has people in nature that I am surrounded by. Any artistic make up who I am as a person. One of those is framing pieces of figurative language and the wizardry of speaking to create something I like called poetry. So without further ado, Jessica, come on up. Thanks, everybody. OK, I'm good. Oops. <laughs> I'm going to take off my mask so it's easier to hear me. Okay. So I will be reading three of the poems that I have written from over the past two years. They all have a similar theme, which is um, talking about my ethnic roots as being like um, a Vietnamese American and all of the experiences and struggles that I have gone through with coming up and growing up as who I am and where I am today. So the first one that I will be reading is My Dragon Calendar. So goes a little something like this. It would smell like nail polish and a bit of overused acetone, but really it was a childish method of time to count away the days of misery because my understandings of it, of this multicolored yet monotone love for isolation is flawed. But as the brittle leaves of the autumn god itches my 12 haze to the person right next to me and the winter kiss punctures the 11 caddy looks to my red hot frostbitten face, my ten fingers are pulling out the nine, eight, seven, six drops of tears that I would swallow with my own pitiful self. It's five o'clock. My American parents should be home. The night monster is appearing. It's been four hours. They are only three minutes away, yet my two eyes had already been sewn closed, with the brim of my eyelashes shedding only one single tear. So that's my poem, My Dragon Calendar. And now um, the next one I have for today is Love Bound. And this one, I would say, is more of an, like an uplifting, um, coming of age type of poet poetry that I would like to read as being in Asian America here in um, Brockton. So Love Bound. White whiffs of cotton candy clouds bring forth a miraculous stork and a dainty little baby. The sky is her kingdom, and the ground she falls upon is spontaneous. Will it be the gloomy bed of washed-out purple carnations, or the deep emerald forest full of ladybugs and dragonflies? Either way, her delicate fingers still graze along the silky sapphire, sapphire Pacific waters, eagerly searching for love, serenity, and a place 
to feel fear. It's a wizardry in its own, but the yellow stars and crimson night skies tell the story, virtually tracing out maps to a destiny, yet dissolving into the sun's warm embrace as the baby's eyes dawn upon it. Will she ever know the absence of subatomic particles of warmth, or the dragon's eyes grazing of hearth? All of the stakes are high, but until the lights are down, it will see right through you, dear. And the last one I have for today is Mẹ, which means mom in Vietnamese. Um, the story is a bit like um, somber and a bit sad, and it's dedicated to my mom and how she helped me grow up through like the struggle of time of being here in America because it was definitely, it's definitely um, a struggle, of course. Um, so this is Mẹ. Even though the broken English that wasn't even though the broken English that my mother had fed to me wasn't so-called soothing, like the luminous lanterns of the mid-autumn festival, pristine cherry blossoms of my visits to Japan, serendipitous southeast seas of the Viet motherland, golden grains of rice that you would cook, and zen-like breeze that allowed me to breathe. She surely did care. Maybe she didn't embrace it, but through her cunning disguise, there was a blanket of emotions because it was the heart of all adoration. Because beneath the cold aura was a woman who had sacrificed her dream so that I could dream. And that's all I have for today. Thank you all, Oops. Sorry, there's a big spider. I'm just gonna pretend it's not there. Jessica, that was beautiful. Thank you so much. So coming up next, we're gonna do some open mic. We've got three people who signed up who volunteered to read some of their poetry. The first person we have come up, uh, coming up is Ivanji. Ivanji, come on up, thank you. So my poem is titled 2020, A Dumpster Fire of a Year. It was December 31st, 2019, 11.59 p.m. We were heading to a new decade. The past one reached its end. This year looked great as I was thinking ahead. 2020 vision was in many articles I read. What it had in store for us, nobody knew. The details are many rather than few. January starts off the new year. Sadly, this month did not bring much cheer. Kobe Bryant and his daughter died, a tragic moment where all of us cried. Stunned, I realized the fragility of life. Anything can end it, even the smallest po pocket knife. February, a chance for redemption. Unfortunately, like last month, there was no exemption. I had a school assignment, watched the State of the Union address. Pelosi tore up the speech, which made the front page of the press. After finishing it, I had so many thoughts. My observations flowed out like untangling earbuds and knots. March was a month I'll never forget. The 13th was the date that left many upset. The shutdown, where everything stopped due to COVID, felt to me as if the whole world exploded. All of my school plans quickly fell apart. This month left me with a broken heart. April, settling into my new life. This new quarantine and mask thing was causing much strife. Joyful Easter traditions changed to be safer. It's becoming evident that 2020 is not in our favor. We thought this thing would blow over, no big deal. With COVID leaving me out of school, I don't know how to feel. May came and things were just getting worse. This was starting to feel like a curse. At least on May 15th, it was my birthday. Then death struck, leaving us in disarray. On Memorial Day, George Floyd was killed. This was not the first time that black blood was spilled. June marked the start of the summer. We couldn't go out though, that was a bummer. I watched George Floyd's funeral on TV. So many emotions are flowing inside me. Black Lives Matter was coming stronger than ever. Maybe this year was changing for the better. July brought the year closer to being over. Now's not the time to lose our composure. A legend, an icon, John Lewis sadly dies. His words and actions 55 years ago proved very wise. Barack Obama delivered his eulogy, bringing us back together as a community. August arrives, the summer is complete. School is starting soon, that's pretty neat. 
Chadwick Boseman died of colon cancer. Why did this happen? We asked with no answer. No one wanted this, not during this hard time. Wakanda forever, his words will forever chime. September, school is officially in session. I was finally back in class, more progression. Another person has died, Ruth Bader Ginsburg this time. 2020 is robbing us of so many lives, it feels like a crime. We lost Chadwick Boseman and John Lewis to rename too. I wish we could reset this year and start anew. October, spooky time is here. The first week something happened that brought much fear. Breaking news, Donald Trump the president tested positive for COVID. Anyone can get the virus, duly noted. Arrogance and ignorance the president possessed. The reality must have been hard for him and his supporters to digest. November was voting season, a time where emotions were running high. Joe Biden won the election, and it was far from a tie. When the next one comes, I'll be old enough to vote. Hopefully, the situation in our nation will be on a better note. Thanksgiving came, but it just wasn't the same. We were still separated from our loved ones of COVID to blame. December, we find that the end is nigh. Time to wave 2020 goodbye. A COVID vaccine is out, a sign of hope. We still must wear masks and wash our hands with soap. Christmas festivities were quiet and, and dim. The most wonderful time of the year was feeling very grim. A mess in the White House full of political unrest. A curse and a blessing. The pandemic brought the worst and the best. A time for sadness with many unfortunate deaths. A time for rising up. An innocent life taken, followed by many protests. Over these 12 months, it was made clear that 2020 was really a dumpster fire of a year. Thank you. Ivanji, thank you so much. Next up, we have Anjali. Hi everyone, good afternoon. My name is Anjali Andre, and this short poem I wrote about 12.30 a.m. this morning, and then I started waking up late. So, let's see. This is how it goes. Food. Food is good. I'm always in the mood for food. Some food is unhealthy, like the tiny chocolates for the wealthy. Some people like eating healthy, but that's not me. I'd rather slouch on the couch and watch TV with a bucket of fried chicken. The end. That was perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> and then finally, we have Jason Wright up to the mic. That was a tough act to follow. <laughs> that was... I like food, food is good, food is great. Um, so I'm just gonna, so um, yeah, um, my name is Jason Wright and uh, I'm uh, uh, the editor of oddballmagazine.com and uh, president of the Oddball Foundation. And I'm gonna read a couple poems for you in Brockton today. You see that car? Did you just see that car that drove by? They have my car. How do you take my car like that? Wish I had that car. Anyway, uh, I'm gonna read a, a few poems and uh, I just wanted to thank everyone. Th Christina, thank you for coming today. It's gonna be a great reading and uh, let's do this, here we go. Uh, this is uh, my old book, Train of Thought. There we go. I'm trying this little thing called TikTok lately. I don't know if you know that. It's like this thing and um, I'm just like, cataloging a little bit of, oh, like I'm on the lowest dose of medication, right? right? So, uh, well, and, uh, I don't know how to stop it, but it's okay. Um, anyway, this is my latest book, Train of Thought. And this is my new book, Train of Thought 2. Now, Train of Thought 2 is available on oddballmagazine.com um, on the bookshelf. And uh, I have a lot of these, because uh, you know I have them on me. But this one you have to get online on the Oddball Magazine bookshelf. So here's a poem from this one. It's called, uh, Delete, Destroy, and Return to the World. And um, real quick, the, re the reason why I wrote all these poems was because I have anxiety, much more than that actually. I have schizoaffective disorder, which is a fun little disorder that people give you when you have a mood disorder and a thought disorder. And they say, hey, we don't know what you are. It's called schizoaffective, and that's what they did. So I wrote these poems on the red line of Boston, Massachusetts, 
and um, they got me through a lot. So this one's called Delete, Destroy, and Return to the World. I'm going to calm down, write a thought that has meaning now. So here I am in loss as I've ever been. I have two things to do, sleep or create. I can't sleep because I slept too late, so I'm going to sit down and try to create. Words can be beautiful when you let them strike the heart with meaning. Words can be ugly when you lose feeling, and if your heart is still beating, then you haven't lost feeling. There's a lot of emotions up in the air. Ask God, is he there? And you might feel something there. Ask the devil, and you know he's always there, being the catalyst for destruction and despair. I don't need anyone. I just need to find strength in myself. Like my dad once told me, he puts a helmet over my head and say, protect my thoughts from leaking out like a leaky faucet. But I know I have this little imp inside making me noxious. Every time I clean out my closet, he throws more shit on it. But honestly, my health needs a booster shot. Thought I was strong enough. Guess not. But I have to find the strength that lies in me somewhere. Bipolar is just another place and I've already been there. And diagnosing me different, I really don't care because we all have our own crosses to bear. I'm strong enough and just down in the rough trying to dig up enough stuff and bury it deep down. I guess I should let it all out, cry on your shoulder, but you know I'm not going to do that because every day I get older, I can become more like a soldier, an eagle, I stare on a world grown colder, and yeah, it's not over, I know I'll get through this. I'm tough, tough enough to deal with this without turning it all to weakness. Just have to pretend that everything is okay again and keep on with the peace and keep on with the pen. Because I try to be who I am when truth is I don't know what I am or where I've been and why I can't find my mind time to sleep again, but the world is peace and zen. And if I look hard enough, something will tell me that I'm more than just a psycho or celebrity. I have to keep going one foot after another, be real, stay real, and find something in nothing because I know I have it in me to transcend through this negativity. I've got to keep it in center, the cipher, the circle, the hole in the half, the 2020 eyes I see through. This is just a hurdle, and you know I'm stronger than this. Kill the negativity and let the poison seep out of my skin. Collect it in a pan and put it in the trash bin. Delete, destroy, and return to the world. Make something out of this pain. This world is yours. So, so I'm like riding on the train, like from like one one place in Boston to the other place in Boston, and you know you guys were probably there, you know. And I was uh, riding, and I'd have my headphones on, and no one would see me, and I'd just be riding because I was like in my own little head, you know. And there was a lot of stuff going on, so. Um, that's why I wrote Train of Thought, and this is the conclusion of Train of Thought too. So this one starts uh, halfway home, and this is almost this is all the way home. So if this one ended at Charles M G H, which it did, this one starts off at Kendall, and if you know the red line, Kendall, Central, Harvard, you know Porter, Davis, home. You know, so for me it was that. So um, here we go. This is a poem. You are not paying attention. I'm going to keep writing till you learn the lesson that I'm teaching. Poetry to me is a life source, an ocean, a heart beating, and peace is pain, and we all feel something sometime. That's why poets like you write and rhyme, because we sing and climb uphill. I'll keep writing like this, like this is my will. I'll give it to you. All I got, a bunch of notebooks and a letter to burn up in my plot. Bury me with these pages, because it represents the three stages. Born breathing, live with reason, and when you cease to be, the last word out of a poet's mouth should be poetry. I'm not going gentle into that good night, like Dylan, Thomas, Whip it, Bob Dylan, knocking on heaven's door, Annabelle Lee, Edgar Allan Poe, Keats, O to a Greek and earn every word of Bukowski, Henry Rollins, Anger, Leonard Cohen's Truth. These are the poets I strive to be. Never been published because I'm missing something. Something maybe when I die they'll see me. Let my words rotate the world. Let my mind feel peace. Put me in the urn and let me learn that sometimes it's good to shut up. Let love release. Stand up and be counted. Peace. Pound the pavement streets. Never stop and never give up. Now let me pass the mic to you. See what you can do. This is my last poem. This is from the book. Remember, Remember why we do this for? To put poetry in the refrigerator door? Like, A plus, look at what I did. That was what it was like when I was a kid. Now we play with toy guns, run on sentences, potentious pertuches, rob us and make us poetic losers. We drill to the core of the earth with poetic bullets and a steel drill. That's the will I have, signed and dated, undead. I roll on strong like a granite wall. Odd ball, sense one, out to take it all. The traffic on this train has made me cease to be. Too much coffee in the bloodstream. This ice cream dream starts to melt. Remember, this is the will of a one-man magic trick. A magician on a mission, thinking diligent and insidious, insignificant, procreatic, and I'm a toy in the attic, because all the worst, destroying all those dreams I had as a child. I'm just a wrinkle in time on a high space line, driving towards fast food in some school. I'm a magician. Remember that? Poof, is this your card? Poet pulling rabbit out of the hat. That was it. So this is, this is available on my website, oddballmagazine.com, and this book is available in my backpack. Thanks.
And up next. All right. Thank you, Ivanji and Anjali and Jason. We appreciate it. We're going to take a quick intermission. We've got some snacks over under the tent over here for those of you who are with us. And during the intermission, I'm going to have a quick little interview with Jessica. And then we'll be back uh, as a group for our featured poet for today, which is Christine. OK, thank you so much. We're going to take a little break. All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Deidre Smith, and I'm here with Jessica Nguyen, and uh, she was our student featured poet this afternoon at Everyone Has a Voice. Thank you for joining us, Jessica. I just have a couple of questions for you. So when did you first realize that you wanted to be a writer? So the first time I really realized that I wanted to be a writer was ever since I was introduced to well, the art of poetry in English class. I really liked how you had the freedom to express your words in a manner where it wasn't so constructed and there wasn't really a format that you had to follow. You were free to express yourself in any way possible. Like even so, even though there are a lot of whole poetry formats that you're kind of introduced to in um, the curriculum, there are a lot of ways that you can just go about it, which I did for the three poems that I have read today. So that's really when I was interested in writing because I saw how free you could be with expressing your own words and shaping it into just a piece of art or visual that you would like the world to see. I know that your sister is with us today here in person. My next question is, what does your family think of your writing? So, okay, so for my writing, my family, the majority of them, they speak Vietnamese and I am bilingual and I can write pretty fluently in Vietnamese as well. And for that, they kind of do like jokingly say here and there that, you know, you're not saying the right things in, you know, Vietnamese. So I do correct it, but I know how to write and I have a tutor who teaches me how to write. And I do also express my own words in Vietnamese and I write, I've written a few poems in Vietnamese actually. And some of them were dedicated to my family members, such as my grandparents. And um, they loved it for the fact and of how it was pretty like naive and kind of like childish it was like a warm little bright thing that they really enjoyed and they keep it hanging it by their beds um, by their bedside and I find it to be pretty funny for the fact and as so for my writing here like my poetry and just my English writing in general they really appreciate and admire how I can express myself through my through my words and how I can formulate it into a thing where I would, you know, express myself and how I also combine that with my art as I have, you don't see it right now, but I have drew my mom in the piece of poetry that I have written about her and that's the thing that they also admire about me as well. Has your idea of poetry changed since you started writing poetry? It has definitely changed because when I was first introduced to poetry, they would usually, like my teachers would usually give me like a s simple format to follow. Like I know that high cues are pretty like a uh, popular one to follow and I had no idea that your poems like could, like didn't have to rhyme in a certain way and it just can be free of itself. Um, besides the things that you just mentioned, has there been something that was most surprising to you that you learned through writing poetry? So through writing poetry, I found that for me, the most ideal way to write it was to think of an image or a visual in your mind and kind of resonate with it with your own words. Like for me, whenever it comes to whatever writing that I am given, like a prompt, a writing assignment, and all that sort, I kind of first think of the mood that I am trying to encapsulate into the piece of writing. And I do that a lot with poetry, and I find that it helps me a lot, and that it really brings the mood that I'm feeling into my own words. Um, are you on social media? And how does social media affect your writing? 
the most part, people who know me, I am very well on social media and I, I see a lot of things on it and uh, for the most part it does kind of help me, like um, I see what goes on in the present day world and I kind of try, I kind of try to like resonate with it and put it into my own piece of writing. I feel like keeping up um, to date with what's going on in the world through social media can really help you see what you should write about or what you know, what to create in general. For the most part, when I am writing pieces of writing or like poetry, I do like to keep my phone off and just really embrace myself with nature to get the fullest and raw pieces of word that I can capture together, together in poetry. And finally, Jessica, if you could pass along one piece of advice for young writers, what would that be? So, to, so the advice that I would give the majority who likes to write, like whatever age you are, just feel free to express yourself. There are no rules, there are no limits and expectations that you have to really meet within poetry. It's really all what you want to make it to be and just having fun with it and exploring new ideas like how I did with my visual idea of being in a certain mood can really help you find to a certain comfortable spot that you can you know enjoy yourself with with writing poetry awesome. Jessica thank you so much we appreciate it um, everybody had a nice conversation we had some nosh and some drink and um, we're back so I would like to introduce our feature for the afternoon uh, Christina Liu She's been part of Everyone Has a Voice uh, and Voices of Diversity, but um, Christina now is part of our family, and it's wonderful to have her um, join us this afternoon. So Christina Liu's parents escaped China's Cultural Revolution, settling with her to live in New York City, China, Chinatown. This backdrop informs much of her writing. Her poetry is published in Dream International Quarterly and most recently Mass Bay's Libraries LibGuides. She is a contributor to the anthology Metamorphosis Are Not Enough, Poetry and Prose by the Street Feet Women, where she has been a member since 2014. She began her foray into quote organizing the, Brockton, the Boston Boston Poetry Marathon in 2020, where again, uh, she will be organizing for uh, this August, I believe, she's going to have the Poetry Marathon. Uh, she frequently, she frequently um, writes anthologies, tentatively titled Word in the World. Recent readings include the Boston Poetry Marathon, the Boston Poetry Saloon, Jamaica's Plains uh, chapter and verse. She dreams and spare moments of green places, rushing waters, and dumplings. And we are fortunate to have Christina Liu join us today. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. It means a lot. Um, and I, I think someday the Brockton Poetry Marathon will emerge probably sooner rather than later. But it's been, it's been so inspiring hearing from all of you, particularly our young poets. Um, it's, it's really amazing, you guys are the future. <laughs> so, okay. Um, I was thinking about the order in which to read um, some of my selected poems. And I, I think in honor of our um, student reader and um, really the AAPI um, focus, this year, I'm actually going to read a short piece to start off with, and it's called Blue Dress. Um, it's after the Vietnamese poet Bui Gan, which means that it's a very, very loose interpretation, or it's inspired by the original Vietnamese poem. Um, so this is Blue Dress by Bui Gan. We move up, blurring mist blinds. We step, the path slips from grass, from love. Youth is sorrow soddened. We wait for apparitions to be swallowed by moon. Remember our birthing, 
a woman sways in blue. Remember silkworms feasting on mulberry leaves as river fills our throats. The second piece is um, <laughs> another pandemic poem. <laughs> So I don't know if anyone has um, heard recently of the great, the great Conjunction. It was supposed to take place um, December 21st, 2020. And um, this quote by earthsky.org frames it very, very well. And it gives a little bit of context by which um, I'm writing about this cosmic event. So this poem is both about the pandemic as well as the disappointment after the Great Conjunction of 2020. EarthSky.org. Today's great conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn will be highly conspicuous in the West just after sunset. The pair will only be 0.1 degree apart at the exact moment of the conjunction. Some say they will look like an elongated star. Will they? Or will they look like a double planet? December 21st, 2020. Fizzle of conjunctions double forked year. Even suburban trees grow listless, heave at possums. Rats take over lilacs and offal. We wait for a falling, for a crowning. I want your fingers here, crackling against this moon. My pale face on Zoom, pupil seeking my visage against so many continences, counting against vaccine odds. Odd how we pace, sun up, faces down to scan, carpets, crevices, cedar chips, rank by November. Jupiter and Saturn touch tonight, almost. One bloated ego against rings, restricting even this. Our eyes scanning sky, fooled by plain lights, the bodies we miss. Thank you. <laughs> um, I forgot to mention that the last poem was um, published by the Mass Lib Guide. This, this one is as well, but it was um, in 2019. And it's called A Lunar Poem in honor of um, the Lunar Chinese New Year. A lunar poem. I dreamt of blood red canary pages edged in saffron. One horizon, one dash. The pigeons outside our grime, our cracked glass overlooking Triborough Bridge, our tribe warbled. I was always afraid of firecrackers each new year. Couldn't tell them apart from red envelopes, red badges, scarlet shamed, my face at the food stamps and lunch tickets. My sister and I never had strawberry jello until public school, quivering and intact in artifice. We swallowed while fire crackled new animals. Ram, pig, tiger, dragons breathing in our small cavities, sharp tongues lashing on our faces. Blood welts. The next poem is um, actually based on a writing exercise. And um, <laughs> it, uh, it asks a bunch of workshop members to, to write a time when we stole something. And I remember stealing a dinky little ring off of New York City's Chinatown. I generally don't steal. Um, but I do remember that. <laughs> that particular moment. Um, and it's simply called, I stow that ring within sight. I stow that ring within sight, rust glimmering under neon punk, under Canal Street's trash. It's poverty for song, a sparrow, for distinction between rust or sun, dust or marrow. My mother bought her own ring some years before before nights of glass shards, howling dogs, machine guns eyes, scent of MSG from father, sham. Swimming together away from China, he held to her feet, hair, her bloated belly. She filled me with sea, tentacles alight, 
his heart pure ink regrets. Dawn, seven years, then ten years later, she threw small stars into their dingy abyss. Father caught the keys each time. I watched him enter, burn peanut oil, eat bitter melon. Wages in his pocket jingled to nothing. For years, she wanted pieces of diamond, chipped oboe, jade, some emblem of the gold mountain promised, and not my father's waiter shirt, archetypal badge of surrender, a sigh. Where are my gold slippers, my throne, my heart, my sea? Mother chokes salt, begins to fetch. Thank you. This next piece is um, called Snapshot, and um, it was recently published, well, last year in Pangaris. Snapshot. Glimmer on the sidewalk, August grit smells of old hot dog water, pigeons bathing in fountains, children running into fountains, shimmying up fire escapes, and this whole damn apple, wavy with summer stank and construction yells, and how mommy stops me from buying arancini as I quell saliva and lust, boys don't grow tall and harder in their Jordache jeans, break dancing near the jungle gym, and Gina can't have enough aqua to keep her bangs so high, closer to empire, her state the apple of her ass taunting the entire playground, even the cigarette smoke snakes a corner, all over, all over, there are diamonds on Canal Street, there are needles in the sky, and hawkers hiding from police, and their warning cries down street grids, our oceans sonic and important, so blankets of fuchsia, sienna, wrap up, as hands hide tchotchkes, fruit dragons all running away from the scrabble, gaudy dragon ghetto of the Northeast. Chinatown, Chinatown, how your alleys run my veins. Um, I, I am an academic advisor by day, <laughs> so I wrote an academic advising poem my student cries to me. My student cries to me, my office. Overhead lighting shines me, complicit, greedy. She tells me the professor is racist. She can't pay any more tuition. She designs small hospital rooms, white gowns, alabaster nurses, is told she can't spell, is called girl twice. I nod. Tell her I understand. I grow fat on administration, student objectives, learning out, comes. She beseeches me, wants the words. I agree, this is bias. I turn my screen, consult the guidelines from academic policy, refer her to two other administrators. My eyes dart down. <sighs> I know you are right. My yellow skin embeds memories and my cheeks burn, fuses to your own now, so hot. I email her the correct PDF. This next piece was inspired by, um, actually uh, an article I read, I believe in The Guardian, but it was since followed up on CNN and other world media. Um, and it's from the words of a Korean comfort woman, Kim Bok Don, um, comfort women being essentially sex slaves and you know, tokens of war to, in this case, Japanese soldiers. Um, and it was her quote that really broke my heart. So I entitled it Spinster. She says, I was born as a woman, but never lived as a woman. Kim Bok Dong. Korean comfort woman who died on January 3rd, 2019, at the age of 91. Here is my old rice, yellow toenails, white skin flakes clinging to opaque tights. Here is my bark of skin scratching against you, mongrel, raven-clawed, furtive branch, 
There, my jaundiced eyes glint towards crows. This is a decaying womb. Woman is vessel carried out in ancient urns in search of shape, a beggar moving from glass huts to city alleys. Here is brackish water, river mud, papyrus, wells inked by drowned girls and the aunt's conjuring daughters. Here is chimney and soot, ropes on railway tracks, blood on the walls, those burned at stakes, those who picked up nuclear waste, the comfort women who knew no comfort. I was born as a woman, but never lived as a woman. Wise crones, glorious witches, they rattle their bones and dentures, alight with the freedom of nothing left. Wombs, hips, lips grinding rocks. Hallelujahs heard by no one. No sparrows to carry on. This piece is untitled, so if anyone can think of a title for me, that would be great. Right now it's called my Statue of Liberty poem, but given the surreal time we've had in the last five or six years, I, th I think it's pretty fitting still. Untitled. She stands back to the billowing wind, the green isolated wreckage of a gift long rusted, pained by consumption and a thousand centuries of rain. No great wind lifts her dress so that we may see the woman, the girl underneath the green, the flesh of the promise, the tired come, the hungry, in masses, gray and forever. The land is divided into lines, state, brother, color, north and south, and sister and bloodlines, and the lines continue to threaten until, until the cup will crack one day, until something more than blood will flow from the earth below. She stands on land that is half island, half haven. They will come because of streets which are gold, because of the burning fields of sugarcane and the burning buildings of genocide, fratricide, they will come from hunger and a thirst for something more ambiguous, something not, never to be found under a rusting steel skirt. Fairies circle like birds or prayers around her. When they come, they will renounce their homelands, their names, and the places of wandering long ago. The old streets melt away so soon, already, now they turn to face destinies as fragile as islands, the uncertain mooring rocks a lullaby. They are as unknowing as babies. The great green lady never smiles. Her glacial beauty is a mocking promise. And yet, we wait for the wind to blow her dress. We wait for her to reveal her secrets. And I, I have two more pieces, um, a longer piece um, called I Am, and I'll start with that one. I am. I am sunset. I am a culmination of days, that final slice of peach. Each faltering sun's rays point towards me, fingertips of dawn, of rose. I am sunrise. I am music filtered through the ears of water. I am subterranean stone, sea rock. I am that place of sanctuary in a world of rockets, of bullets in a sky of fire. I am silence in birds and the eyes of mothers, a cool palm against a fevered brow. I am day, I am night. I am the enemy of neither, the ecstasy of equilibrium. I am that wonderful balance. I am that chapel, the girl, that one, goes to in late afternoons when the school doors close and the texts are put away. I am dust rising in sunlight, in darkened rooms, against velvet curtains, a prisoner of nature. I am rainbow, song. I hold the world against my breast. The world answers back to me. 
The ear is a freedom the most imprisoned man can understand. I am that priest once more in confessionals on the altar, giving out redemption like roses, the scent of your lover's tears. I am sleepless night and glorified surreal day, music in synchronicity with sex, making love, coloring in darkness. I am that poet on the stage, speaking the world, speaking pearl, making love to the moon. Teardrop, pearl, moon, pupil, open mouth. Oh, I am punctuation assaulting you. I am beyond metaphor. I find seashells in the rainforest, gold between one's nails. I live on the ocean floor, oblivious to time and clocks. I live beyond law. I am never afraid of darkness. I live by heartbeat and breath and light and hunger and thirst. I listen to the song of the crickets. I am moan, I am every yes and hallelujah and at last. I am comfort, I am rain. I turn sand into soil, into wheat and bread and meat and milk. I am the color green, I am salt. I am a color telephone coil stretching, stretching its arms over your throat. I am henna and menstruation and new volcanoes bursting for the very first time. I define, I affirm myself without you, despite you. I make love in wheat fields and in Paris. I am sex, I am solace creeping into every corner. I am with you in prayer. I am there, circling, cutting the air like a bird. I break chains. I am birth and babies and each smile conquering evil. I am the monk believing in this earth. I am crooked path and silver moon and the absolute clarity between the two dragon veins filtering down to mountains like rivers. I am that confidence after danger. I am Africa and Asia and the sun warming both. Thank you. My last piece was um, actually written for the city of Brockton um, and it's called Birds in Love after the artist Roy Jerry. Um, and it was supposed to be on, on display at the Brockton Library. Unfortunately, it wasn't because COVID hit, but now it's online. <laughs> so the title is called Birds in Love after the, um, the poet, Roy's Jerry. They twin noble join side by side whilst the sky screams, Munch's verisimilitude in vibrant green waves behind them. A road to where? Their plumage is fire. Fire cannot contain. They sing and squawk for ravens, robins, eagles, dove. All the birds of the world bow now. They join as twins, all the feathered ones noble, in a verisimilitude of song, of belonging. They form in an arc of V, cutting through eons. Thank you all very, very much. This was wonderful. I appreciate it. So another chapter of Everyone Has a Voice has been put in the books. We look forward to next month, July 17th, where we will have Jean-Denis Joaquin Leonardo Lin and our student feature, Yaya Blake. I want to thank Christina and Jessica for being our features today. What wonderful poetry they, uh, they shared with us. Our um, open micers, um, where else can you hear the truth of what's going on um, in these days? Of course, we'd like to thank uh, Director Paul Engel and the Brockton Library for giving us this wonderful space where we can now read our poetry. And most of all, I want to thank everyone who came to listen. We don't do that uh, lately, but this was a wonderful day to listen and take everything in. So again, thank you very much on behalf of Everyone Has a Voice, and we will see you next month, July 17th. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Uh, we have just experienced uh, Christina Liu at Everyone Has a Voice uh, uh, in Brockton, 
Uh, we're, it's a beautiful day. It's uh, Brockton Public Library. And I'm here with Christina Liu. My name is Jason Wright. I'm the editor of Oddball Magazine and the podcast host of The Oddball Show and president of the 501c3, The Oddball Foundation. And that guy was listening to, I believe, Keep on Rockin' in the Free World by Neil Young. Did that sound like that? Yeah, it did. Um, so I'm here with uh, Christina today. Um, Christina, uh, welcome to, uh, you know, thanks for reading and welcome to Everyone Has a Voice. How's it going? It's going really well today, yeah. Like, hey, you hold it. You, you hold it. Yeah. You talk a little bit. How's it going? It's going really well. I'm very, very happy with the events. Right. So tell me a little bit about uh, your experience uh, today at Everyone Has a Voice. Sure. Um, it's, it's really nice to be back. Um, I, the last time I was at Everyone Has a Voice, um, it was 2019, pre-COVID. Um, none of us had any idea what would come our way. So to be back about two years later is just both surreal and, and really incredible, but it's always been a really supportive community. Philip has been very gracious, very kind, and um, it's definitely one of the, the more diverse scenes that I've, I've had the pleasure of experiencing, especially in terms of poetry, so that's been really nice. So there were some young writers uh, here opened up. Um, can you tell me when you first started uh, writing poetry? Yeah, I actually started a little bit late. I um, I started writing when I was in college um, quite a while ago, but I, I took a very basic literature call, course called Images of Women Literature and read the poetry of Anne Sexton and Sylvia Plath. And um, I was just awed, absolutely awed. I'd always written in my journals and enjoyed literature and writing, but um, that's when I started. You know, it was actually in college. Yeah. Um, so you have a really great writing style um, and great performance. And, you know, you missed it, but actually you can catch it, you know, you probably just caught it on video here, and this is the aftermath. So, you saw her read, and she did. And Christina did a great job. But uh, let me just tell you: When did you realize that your your words had power? That your that your writing had power? I, I think on a very personal level, um, you know, writing and poetry always saved me. Like I said, I had always written in my journal, and. Um, you know, sought solace in, in literature, you know, so I was reading all during math class and, you know, recess, and I, I just always kind of fell into the world of books, but um, writing and just kind of being immersed in, in terms of the form, you know, in that, in that kind of discovery, I, I, I really found an outlet for a lot of the thoughts that I couldn't previously articulate, um, so that was really nice. So after writing for a while, when did you decide it was time to start sharing your poetry? Not until much, much later in life. So it actually was um, before grad school. I started reading around the open mic scene in Cambridge and in Boston. Um, this was in the late 90s, the early 2000s. Um, so I, I kind of fell into the spoken word scene and then um, went to grad school and became more, I guess, I don't want to say educated. That's not the right word. But I learned a lot more about craft in grad school. Exactly. So you learned more about form in grad school, yeah. Um, so, speaking of uh, grad school, um, what was one of your uh, what was one of the, the the techniques that you learned in school um, for a writer? Like, what what advice would you give to someone who wants to um, strengthen their form? That's that's a fantastic question. I would say that everyone has you know um, as the the theme of this program um, speaks to everyone has a voice and everyone has a very unique style that you know they really shouldn't bend to um, they really shouldn't be out there appeasing um, the critics you know um, those in the upper echelon so they really need to stay true to their own voice because if they lose their voice they lose the core of what they're trying to communicate and I, I think I feel that so so strongly even more so now as I get older that's really great. You know, I, I really think that I agree with you. I totally agree with you. I think being authentic and you can know the forms, you know, you can know the forms and you can know all of the different poetry forms, but it doesn't mean you have to subscribe to them. Um, or if you do, you know, you can do it, you know, it's just say like, ha ha, I know how to do this too. You know, like you know, read a, you know, write a Sistina and be like, ha, but then write whatever you want to write afterwards. Right. Um, 
So you just published a brand new book. It's you want to talk a little bit about it? Um, all right. So uh, this book that you published, it was it's fresh. It's from 2020. So what's the name of the new book? Yeah, it's actually um, uh, an anthology that I'm a part of. It's called Metaphors Are Not Enough, and it's um, actually put out by a performance group that I've been a part of since 2015, The Street Feet Women. So the name of the book is called Metaphors Are Not Enough. I have a handful of poems as well as um, an essay, uh, a nonfiction essay called The Poet in the Classroom. Um, so you can see it there. So let's talk about that. So um, so you, you basically have a poetry troupe, a poetry troupe, um, you know, sort of like, uh, you know, a tribe called Quest, you know, has a tribe called Quest, you know, uh, uh, you know, whatever. What I'm getting at is, you know, we have poetry groups, you know, here's an example, I'm going to go back. So there was a, there was a, back in the day, there was the Native Tongues, right? And they were a tribe called Quest, De La Soul, they were uh, Queen Latifah, and M I think MC Light was part of it, and, um you know, Jungle Brothers, and anyway, they formed a, a, a troop, right? And they were stronger together. Um, do you feel like joining, like, what's the advice for someone who wants to join, like, a poetry group? Like, how do you, how do you join, like, a, um, not just a group or, like, a, like a, a workshop, or how do you, how do you get involved with, like, a group so you can support each other's writing? For sure. Um, I, I think a part of it happens organically, you know, like seeks like. Um, I had just kind of independently, outside of my friends and family, started going to poetry readings. Um, and, you know, I, I found friends that just wanted to organize. Um, and oftentimes someone will hear what I have to say or someone else has to say, and they'll, they'll say, oh, let's, let's collaborate, let's do this together. Um, so a lot of it happens just by, you know, to use Joseph Campbell's quote, following your bliss. Um, and I'll leave it at that. So thank you so much. Christina Liu, thank you for being today at Everyone Has a Voice. And um, where, can we, where can people find you and reach out and say, wow, great reading? Uh, it's a good point. I don't have a website nor any kind of um, publicity or, you know, um, media as of the moment, um, but certainly if they wanted to reach out, they could do so through the Brockton Library or Street Feet. So thank you. Check out Christina Liu's poetry. It's dynamic, it's powerful, it's beautiful. This is Jason Wright. This is a, a beautiful day in Brockton. It's been a beautiful day. Thank you for being on the, uh, here today. And uh, till next month, uh, everyone has a voice. Mm -hmm.